Bentley Lyon will be represented this evening by his son, his son-in-law, Tony Marquez. And I would like to ask all of his University of California teammates to come up with Bentley to present him with this award this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, as they're coming up this evening, I was sharing uh, some information on Bentley with about five members of our, our committee, and every one of them responded the same way. That guy was a stud. <laughs> <laughs> Bentley Lyon attended Albany High School, but he did not wrestle there as there was no wrestling team. Bentley began his wrestling at the University of California, Berkeley, where Hall of Fame coach Henry Stone was his wrestling coach. Bentley was the Far Western Champion and Pacific Association Champion in 1951 and 52. He was also the Portola Freestyle Champion in 1952. He won the Pacific Coast Intercollegiate Wrestling Championship two times and was the outstanding PCI wrestler in 1952. He was also the team captain. Bentley was a member of the 1948 and 1952 PCI Championship teams at Cal. In 1952, Cal was the co-championship team with Washington State. He placed fourth in his junior year at the NCAA Wrestling Championships and was the NCAA Division I Wrestling Champion as a senior. He was also a two-time NCAA All-American. In his senior year, Avison Guerrero, you better listen to this, his record was 9-0. <laughs> and he defeated Maynard Skinner, the University of Colorado, the, in the championship finals. And incidentally, Mayor was both the uh, Maynard was both the mayor of the city of Davis and the coach at UC Davis. Bentley was the first California collegiate res, wrestler west of the Rockies to win an NC2A wrestling championship, and the first Californian to achieve All-American status. He also ran the Boston Marathon in 1975, averaging six minutes and 31 seconds per mile, and is the author of two suspense novels. He and his family came down all the way from Oregon to attend this banquet, and we're glad he did. Ladies and gentlemen, inducted into the California Wrestling Hall of Fame, Mr. Bentley Lyon. I'm a little bigger than you, so I can go a little bit more than five minutes, right? <laughs> Good evening, my name is Tony Marquez, and um, I've had the pleasure of being Bentley's son-in-law for the last 14 years now. And because Bentley cannot deliver his speech in the manner I know he would absolutely love to, he asked me if I'd be his voice for him. And um, I gladly agree to, so here is Bentley's own words. He wrote the speech, and I'm just kind of giving it for him. He says, Thank you for inviting me and inducting me into the California Wrestling Hall of Fame. I am greatly honored. Until receiving Jim Root's phone call inviting me, I had been unaware that such an organization even existed. Well, never too late to learn, but in my case, I didn't miss learning it by much. In fact, I almost missed learning about it altogether. See, exactly one year ago today, I was undergoing brain surgery. Not brain transplant surgery, mind you. <laughs> but brain surgery known as deep brain stimulation, or DBS, to help alleviate the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. A problem which I've had for 13 years now. Apparently, I made the mistake of assuming that I had a brain capable of being stimulated. <laughs> Or perhaps it was something else that went wrong. 
maybe one too many bumps on the noggin, perhaps. Anyway, I sustained a hemorrhagic stroke during the procedure, which paralyzed part of my body and caused other problems much too difficult for even a, uh, an ex-Cal wrestler to comprehend. I'm still unable to speak clearly and lost a block of my memory that extends from the day before the surgery until I reawakened several months later back at my home in Medford, Oregon. During this downtime, I had some fairly bizarre and recurring dreams, one of them I call the Lester Fish Dream, where I dreamt I had been released from the hospital, but with a large fish attached to my body where my left arm belonged. <laughs> the fish insisted that I give him a name, and so I'd be calling him, I started calling him Lester Fish, or just Lefty for short. <laughs> And every time I attended a social function, I'd go around the room introducing my pal Lefty to people, <laughs> offering them my left hand, which in my reality was a fish. <laughs> Strangely, my popularity soon diminished and I found myself talking to a therapist. <laughs> and he advised me to leave Lefty at home in the fridge so he wouldn't spoil. <laughs> During waking hours, I still believed the fish was in the freezer and even conducted a search of the freezer to convince my family that I really hadn't zoned out on it. I even asked my doctor why they hadn't amputated the fish instead of the arm. Whatever the case, I'm still unable to order striped bass in a restaurant. And more than once, I've checked the freezer, kind of hoping Lefty might just show up. Anyway, since the stroke, most of my time has been dedicated to physical therapy. Without the continuing help of my loving family, the progress I've made so far would have been impossible. And my goal is to be out of this wheelchair by this year's end. And now, on to wrestling. <laughs> my wrestling days left me with lots of good memories. I remember napping through most of my classes, reliving wrestling matches instead of concentrating on all the useless academic stuff, like chemistry, math, biology, English, and the rest of it. I was concentrating on takedowns, not cotangents, on reverses, not conservation of angular momentum. And I was also concentrating on near falls, not geomorphography, whatever that is. In the end, I figured I learned a lot more about wrestling than about forestry. In, in fact, about a dozen forestry professors would be quick to agree. <laughs> I made a lot of good friends in those years, and some of them are here tonight. Hugh Mumby is one of them. During his postgraduate time at Cal, he coached and worked out with the other team and also competed in some of the all-comers meets. On one occasion, Hugh was to wrestle a fairly nervous-looking guy who stood quivering next to the mat with his girlfriend. He nervously took off his sweatshirt, revealing an exceptionally frail body. When Mumby was introduced, he took off his sweatshirt, looking about as muscular as his honor, the governor. At this point, the crowd gasped in anticipation of what surely was to be the mismatch of the evening, if not the century. But it was not to be, for Mumby's opponent muttered something like, no way, <laughs> and put his sweatshirt back on, and from that point it was unclear who earned the applause that ensued, and we never saw the new guy again. Henry Stone, where's Henry Stone? Henry Stone? What do you see? Oh, okay. Well, according to Bentley, Henry Stone would entertain his passengers while driving to wrestling meets around the Bay Area. He told of one trip across the country when passing through one of the Midwestern states, he decided, unannounced, to stop by and say hello to an ex-Cal wrestler, uh, wrestler who lived in a town that we were passing through. Well, nobody answered the front door, so Henry went around back. Nobody answered there either. But 
The wash was hanging on the clothesline, and it included three ragged and faded University of California towels. Henry returned to his car and unpacked three brand new Cal towels and hung them on the line in place of the old ones. He left without even leaving a note. Henry never heard from the guy and wondered if he ever realized how he wound up with the new towels. <laughs> I've often thought the guy got off easily, being that he could have hung up Holiday Inn towels instead. <laughs> My good friend Mark Bungie. Mark Bungie had a weird sense of humor. He had a very old and shaggy looking sedan that probably belonged in the county dump, but they wouldn't take it. One evening, Mark and I drove our two dates to the Claremont Hotel, an ostentatious place for the upper crust. The drive-up entrance was shaded by an elaborate, ornate structure and was attended by a squad of doorman and valet car parkers, all waiting to see what crude mechanical contrivance had arrived at their lofty domain. Surely, it was a vanguard of an invasion by hostile enemy aliens. Or not. <laughs> When we were squarely in front of the grand door, Mark stopped the vehicle and turned off the engine, which was equipped with a secret mechanism that prevented the car from being stolen, although I can't imagine anyone wanting to do that. Get this crate out of here, barked one of the attendants. Wash, wax, and make it snappy, Mark told the guy, who appeared to be on the verge of having an epileptic seizure. We entered the place and took our seats in the restaurant, but were refused service, owing our lack of proper clothing and unkempt appearance. We returned to the entrance in time to rescue Bungie's car moments before the tow truck got there. One of the doormen was still in the rear seat trying to turn on the old portable radio that was strapped to the rear of the front seat. <laughs> and finally, and finally, no wrestler's banquet would be complete for me without the presence of my old friend Bob Rudd, whom I usually refer to as one workout, a nickname he earned by virtue of his frequent absences from team workouts. And Bob Bentley says, this is the first time I've been in a tuxedo since showing up as best man at your wedding about 54 years ago. Please note, Bob, I'm wearing a smaller size these days. Again, thank you, for all, or thank you all for inviting me and electing me into membership. I consider this moment the highlight of my involvement with amateur and collegiate wrestling. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bentley Lyons.